Okay, good afternoon. Uh, welcome uh, to the afternoon session, uh, Functional Materials for Energy Storage and Conversion Devices. Um, so uh, my name is Elham uh, Sahrai uh, from Temple University Electric Vehicle Safety Lab. I will be chairing this uh, session. Um, our first presentation for this session is uh, by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Van Li Yang, and the title is Cationic and uh, Anionic Redox Chemistry in Oxide-Based Battery Cathodes. So I would like uh, to invite uh, Van Li uh, to start uh, the presentation. Okay, now I, I, I cannot unmute myself. <laughs> okay, uh, let me share. I suppose you can all see my slides and for this small audience, uh, we can have like a almost closed discussion. So uh, I will talk about our, some of our recent results uh, on the battery cathode, mostly transition metal oxide based battery cathode studies uh, through the soft X-ray spectroscopy, including X-ray absorption rigs that I will explain. Uh, so if we try to define the questions, we try to answer here better. Uh, I guess we all know uh, a battery has two electrodes and the transition metal oxide based cathode works in the way if you charge the battery uh, lithium ion, a reversible, uh, a reversibly uh, reacting uh, oxidation and reduction by the lithium going in and out of the electrode. That's what we, when we talk about the lithium ion or sodium ion batteries, uh, it all in the same way uh, in general like this. So if you charge a cathode, transition metal oxide based cathode, you will oxidize the system. If you discharge, it will reduce the system. So the question we try to answer here is really which part, or I should say which element of the transition metal system is getting oxidized or reduced throughout this electrochemical operation. And this question becomes more important, especially these days when we are talking about the high energy batteries, because we cycle the battery to the very high voltages. Uh, and in that case, if the oxygen get involved, whether that will trigger extra problem. So uh, if we go down to the fundamental level, we're really talking about two types of elements. It's the oxygen and the 3D transition metal. Those are the low cost transition metal used in all the, uh, so far, all the commercial batteries. And if we talk about the oxidation state or the redox state, we're really talking about the 2P electron state of oxygen or 3D electron state of the 3D transition metals. And that's how the soft X-ray spectroscopy comes in. And we also want to see both the surface and the bulk. So in a very simplified model to look at what do I mean by saying soft X-ray spectroscopy, if we have a continuously tunable uh, X-ray photons heating your sample, that means you typically require a synchrotron facility to run this. You will excite a core level electron up to the unoccupied state of the outer shell. And this leads to in physics called excited state. And the excited state is not stable and they will decay. And that's how you get the two type of signals in the soft X-ray spectroscopy. One type is the relaxation of this excited state will release the energy to the outer shell electron comes out. Another way is to release the energy with X-ray photon emitted out directly. That goes to the two very popular names. If you read any papers talking about X-ray spectroscopy, one is called TEY, it's a total electron yield or TFY is a total fluorescence yield. So you count the total number of electrons or photons coming out. And these two techniques, we always use them combined together because they do give two very different probe depths 
uh, one is about 10 nanometers, the other is about 100 to 200 nanometer. So, and the reason uh, soft X-ray, as I just mentioned, is very suitable to study the 3D transition metal oxide. If we look at the key orbitals of the 2P of the low Z element, carbon nitrogen, oxygen, or the 3D state of the 3D transition metals, uh, the soft X-ray excitation, because there is a dipole selection rule, they correspond to the excitation to directly those valence state. And that, that differentiates the soft X-ray spectroscopy from hard X-ray spectroscopy as one of the differences. So here is uh, just an example on the, uh, because of this direct probe on how sensitive this could be. And I have plotted here three selected cases on manganese, iron, and nickel. Uh, so in general, what you can see is if we measure the electrode at different voltage plateau, and we know at a certain plateau, there's a different type of redox reactions. And you will see a vivid change of those spectra. You can get the soft X-ray LH spectra uh, by exciting to directly the 3D state. Because of this sensitivity, you can pretty straightforwardly fit the experimental data, the dotted line, with a, a calculated data through a very simple, just linear combination. All you need is like several reference spectra and you just do a linear combination fitting and you can get a fairly precise quantitative value of the oxidation state. And it works for most of the 3D transition metals uh, as the several examples showing here. So. Uh, with that quick demonstration, however, I would like to focus a bit more beyond just conventional X-ray absorption by asking a question on whether the X-ray absorption does tell us everything on the chemical state already. So this is a material coming from uh, a South, uh, South Bay, uh, I should say Silicon Valley a company, calling the CEO who approached me during a conference on this material. And the interesting part is they found this material, which is magnesium based and the material is already magnesium two plus. However, they found the material used as a sodium ion battery electrode, they could be reduced and they could be cycled for tens of thousands of cycles, very stable. And we know if you reduce the two plus magnesium, Typically, it reaches the metallic zero plus. Uh, it's a metallic manganese, but we know it's not metallic manganese because once you form metallic manganese in the electrode, you, you go into that conversion type of regime. You could never cycle for like tens of thousands of cycles. So uh, with this interesting question, we run just again, a conventional X-ray absorption spectra. Unfortunately, what we see is there is barely any change with the, the charge. This is anode, so the charge is actually the uh, reduced, and this is the oxidized. You barely see any change, and maybe a little bit over here. So that pushed us to go beyond uh, the X-ray absorption and see what else we can get through the soft X-ray spectroscopy. Again, by running the, either the total electron yield or total fluorescence yield by counting the total number of those particles coming out, you get a 1D spectra uh, called X-ray absorption spectra. So now if we ask ourselves, what if we are able to tell not only the total counts of the photon coming out, we, now able, we, we are now able to tell what kinds of photon comes out, like a photon release from this decay will be different from photon release from that decay. So in that way, what we can do is we pull out the total counts, a single digit point, a single data point in X-ray absorption into a spectra because we can resolve the emitted photon energy of all those uh, counted photons over here. In that way, we get another spectra is completely a new dimension of information along the so-called emission energy because in X-ray absorption, everything is integrated with just the counts. So because it's hard to read in this way, we typically plot it in a 2D image and the data we focus on is always with the emission energy below the elastic line, the elastic line without any uh, energy loss. That's why we call them inelastic X-ray scattering. And here's the name of RICS. It's a resonant to the absorption edge and we focus on the inelastic X-ray scattering data. 
So I should say every part in this rigs map tells different stories and tell us different information. But in this short talk here, I will focus only on one part of data and to talk about one type of information is this part over here. And we come back to this question. I said there are two electrodes. We hope to see the difference, but we don't see much with X-ray absorption. But now if we extend it into a RIGS map, and if we focus only on this part, you see, even you never run a RIGS experiment, I bet you can see the contrast of the charge and these charged uh, uh, results so clearly the contrast here. And this particular point uh, corresponds to uh, uh, so-called D2D. It's a magnet 3D electron D2D excitation, and that happens only with the magnet 1 plus. And magnet 1 plus is uh, speculated about a century ago, about 90 years ago in a paper written in German, but it was never confirmed and never measured. And, uh, we now know the reason because it's very hard to see through the conventional technique, but with the RIGS map, you have greatly improved chemical sensitivity by separating the signal out along this new dimension called emission energy. So with that, uh, I still have five more minutes. So I would switch a little to the oxygen. I also mentioned it's very important to see whether the oxygen is involved in uh, this kind of redox reaction and in what way, whether it's reversible or it's just oxidized and they will become a detrimental effect, uh, especially at the high energy cycling process. Uh, the oxygen, however, to detect whether the oxygen is oxidized or reduced, we face more or less the same kind of problem with a conventional XAS. Uh, if you look at reference compound, it's pretty okay if you look at the XAS, uh, so oxidized oxygen species and the typical oxygen two minus, they are separated within this uh, energy range. Unfortunately, if you look at the transition metal system, however, the transition metal always contribute to your oxygen K X-ray absorption spectra and the contribution from transition metal, those characters, they show up very unfortunate they show up in exactly the same range that you expect to see that. And this is what I always call a Keeling uh, experiment. The reason I call it Keeling experiments is this is a system for all the battery researchers. They know there is no oxygen redox involved in here. But if you look at the oxygen K spectra, you discharge and charge, you see a very strong contrast. And there's a peak showing up exactly at the oxidized oxygen state peak but this system has zero oxidized oxygen. So that already tells us using the XAS is not a reliable probe to see whether the oxygen is involved in the redox reaction. So uh, because this push us to go beyond X-ray absorption, again, just like the Magnus one plus case, we can collect a RIGS map and we can quickly realize there is a specific data point a packet of signal showing up at a different emission energy comparing ways a typical oxygen two minus system with strong hybridization to the transition metal. And this signal, sometimes they show up in X-ray absorption like a field up valley. Like in this case, there is nothing shows up. It's, it's just a valley with peaks dominated by transition metal, but we're able to resolve uh, this peak. And there's a long story over here. Uh, and this peak corresponds to the oxygen redox reaction uh, we can, because we can follow the intensity of this peak upon electrochemical cycling. We can uh, look at the capacity of charge and discharge, and we follow the intensity goes up and goes down, which is a, a circle over here. And they follow uh, pretty well with uh, electrochemical cycling profile. So. Uh, and we also tested other reference compound that I won't have time to talk about to make sure that is indeed an oxidized oxygen feature. And the reversibly change over here means the oxygen is involved in a reversible oxygen redox. So with that, I should conclude my talk. Great. Uh, so I would like to mention X-ray absorption spectral conventional one is still a powerful tool, especially for conventional uh, chemical state probe. But there are many novel chemical states, especially these days, we're talking about 
very high voltage, high energy cycling, and you push the transition metal and the oxygen into the non-conventional uh, state, you often need something that is doing better than conventional X-ray absorption spectra. And RIGS is what we're helping trying to develop in this field. With that, I would uh, finish my talk by acknowledging my postdocs and students, especially Zheng Qing, uh, Ke Hua, and Jin Peng. Uh, most of the talks I, uh, most of the works I mentioned today were done by them. And we have worldwide material collaborators. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so we are right uh, at time for our uh, next presentation. The next presentation uh, is um, titled Ultra Thin Electrodeposited Novel Metal, uh, metal Layers on Max Phases Based Support for Green Energy Production. And the presentation is by uh, Nevenka Elizobink. Uh, and Nevenka is uh, not present. Uh, I will uh, present um, uh, her video for her. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Neven Kalejcovic. I come from University of Belgrade, Center of Excellence for Green Technologies, Institute for Multidisciplinary Research, uh, Belgrade, Serbia. Today, I'm going to talk to you about also thin electrodeposited novel metals layers, next phase space support for green energy production. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation to be part of this special event. be in Los Angeles today since I was planning that. Uh, however, I was prevented by COVID-19 uh, disease. I would like to pay your attention that this presentation contains copyright protected materials, so please treat it confidentially. Before I start with the results, I would like to introduce you to University of Belgrade, one of the biggest and the most important universities from Southeast Europe, ranked among the best world universities by the Shanghai Jiuqiang University ranking list. University of Belgrade consists of uh, 31 faculty and 11 institutes uh, dealing with the science of different fields uh, from natural sciences, social sciences, and uh, also technical sciences. One of the parts of the University of Belgrade is Institute for Multidisciplinary Research, my institution leading research and development institution founded to combine fundamental and applied research in uh, some following research areas, uh, material science, energy and environmental sciences, life sciences, neurosciences, and medical engineering. I work in material science department. I would like also to pay your attention on collaboration network of the Institute of Multidisciplinary Research, University of Belgrade. My institute uh, have established many useful collaborations from all over the world research and scientific institutions uh, from all continents except Africa. Some of them are Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories from California, uh, University uh, of AGH from Krakow, uh, Technical University from Zurich, and many other important scientific institutions. Let's introduce energy problem and as the main one of the main uh, challenges and problems of the contemporary world. Uh, at this slide, US primary energy consumption was presented by energy source 
as you can see, uh, energy consumption and production is based on uh, fossil fuels, uh, petroleum, and natural gas. Only 11% belong to uh, renewable energies, uh, as you also can see. Renewable energy, energy consists of the geothermal, solar, hydroelectric, biomass, waste, biofuels, and uh, other uh, renewable energy resources. That's for renewable energy share. For, for instance, in Euro, Europe 2020, you can see that uh, there is hydropower, geothermal electricity, wind power, biomass electricity, and many other renewable energies from uh, biothermal, biodiesel, and hydrogen also, as from renewables as one of fuels uh, for the future. At this stage, I would like to emphasize advantages of renewable energy sources. To uh, use renewable energy, uh, we will uh, avoid some environmental pollution, uh, greenhouse effects uh, created by carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases present in the atmosphere. So, the target uh, of Europe and the USA authorities uh, is to uh, use renewable energy sources more than fossil fuels in the future. Let's talk about hydrogen, pure high efficiency, environmental friendly fuel, usually produced by gas or oil decomposition in nuclear plants or by biomass degradation. The pure hydrogen is produced by water electrolysis, by established procedure, and from 30% uh, sodium hydroxide solution at 80 degrees of centigrade, nickel based electrodes. The hydrogen produced by water electrolysis is used as a fuel, full fuel in polymer electrolyte membrane for steel cells, while common oxidative agent is oxygen from air. So, hydrogen is considered as environmental friendly, high efficiency, zero emission energy conversion uh, fuel for power sources. Many prospective applications of PEMST in apply applications with portable, stationary, and trade transfer devices. At this slide, it is here just to uh, explain what we are working for. So, actually, we are working on nanomaterials for green energy related applications, not only nanomaterials, also electrodepositive materials, uh, anode or cathode catalysts um, uh, for water electrolysis, and also uh, for anode and cathode catalysts for polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cells. Hydrogen produced in electrolyzers is used as a fuel in polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cells. And then energy produced is used for cars, turbine devices, and other objectives of today. Uh, our presentation will be characterization of the support, titanium alumina carbide, and max phase is one of the max phases, thermal supports, electrochemical deposition of ultra tiny regular layers on uh, titanium alumina carbide support, physical chemical characterization by scanning electron microscopy, X-ray photolite spectroscopy, and uh, energy dispersion spectroscopy, uh, hydrogen evolution reaction or lithium-based catalyst, and also comparison of catalytic obtained activities to commercial carbon supported lithium ERC. Let's talk about characterization of uh, substrate. Substrate is titanium alumina carbide, uh, one of the mixed phases, uh, famous uh, materials. Uh, it was patented for Professor Rashton from Drexel University 2003. Uh, and these materials have excellent properties uh, and desirable properties like high conductivity, high chemical corrosion stability, and it is also commercially produced easily in low cost procedure, uh, also as uh, uh, solid materials and uh, in the power powder form. As for electrochemistry, it is important to emphasize that titanium alumina substrate is very stable in the wide uh, potential range, and uh, it is also 
very suitable for support for catalysts. From behavior electro deposited iridium layers from titanium aluminum carbide, uh, five uh, samples from thicknesses of 4.5 nanometers to 255 nanometers, and they used for investigation of hydrogen evolution in uh, sulfuric acid solution. As you can see, we have deposited uh, iridium uh, from this solution. Uh, by linear cyclotometry, 5 million volts uh, per second, and from this peak and from the charge of the electrodeposited layer should be, uh, by integration, should be obtained, and then also thickness of the deposit using these equations. And this table, it is presented, uh, mentioned five cell samples, and conditions for them the, uh, uh, to the position, we have used concentration of potassium iridium chloride from one millimol to two millimoles, and number of cycles uh, from one to five, and so, as you can see, deposit, the thickness was from 4.5 to 250 by nanometers. Let's see a uh, scanning electron microscopy surface morphology analysis. Uh, uh, from uh, this slide, you can see that sample one and two are almost completely covered, covered and not quite homogeneously covered, but for sample three, four, and five, you can see that there are micro cracks uh, due to the peeling off effects. And for us, it is important that our more uh, thin simple, this one, sample one, was completely covered, even at these arrows uh, we have analyzed by EDS um, the surface, and it was found that iridium is still present at these uh, places. Electron spectroscopy analysis uh, uh, showed uh, the iridium for F spectra for all samples presented in this slide and fitting results. As you can see, we have found only one uh, doublet uh, uh, that's corresponding to the iridium uh, zero oxidation state. We have found only metallic iridium on the surface. It was one of the goals. Electron chemical impedance spectroscopy uh, was used to determine uh, kinetics and mechanism of the reactions. And equivalent circuit use is presented here. As you can see, very good agreement between experimental. Uh, it is uh, by line, is it presented fitting results, and agreement is between the fitting and experimental results is observed. This polarization curve for the best sample, one, uh, the thinnest one, of thickness of 4.5 nanometers, uh, is presented uh, together with iridium supporting commercial carbon support. And as you can see, especially at high intensities, our uh, new catalyst is, uh, the, is exhibiting better catalytic activities. In this table, it is summarized uh, current density, uh, also oil potential at uh, 10 milliamperes per square centimeter, 100 and 300, as it is usual for hydrogen evolution in industrial application. And as you can see, uh, the, the sample R has better activity, even uh, especially pronounced at the high over potential and low, uh, at the low uh, as the low over potential at the 300 milliamperes per square centimeter. And just to conclude, the ultra thin iridium layers were like to deposit it on its titanium alumina carbon support successfully. This catalytic uh, catalyst exhibited high catalytic activities for her in acid solution in comparison to carbon support iridium. One, the best performance was obtained for the, the thinnest one for 
0.5 nanometer TKM. And at last, but not at least, uh, I'd like to thank to my dear colleagues, Dr. Nadimirjovic, Dr. Nedevko Krstajic, Dr. Runo Šlačnevac, Mila Krstajic Pajic, Borka Jovic, Lena Gajic Krstajic and Piotr Žabinski. And also, I would like to thank you for your attention and to thank Ministry of Science, Education and Technological Development, Republic of Serbia, for the financial support. Also thank Professor Miladin Radović from the Texas A&M University College Station for the preparation of titanium alumina carbide substrate. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nevenka Lezovic. I come from University of Belgrade, Center of Excellence for Green Technologies, Institute for Multidisciplinary Research, uh, Belgrade, Serbia. Today, I'm going to talk to you about also thin electrodeposited novel metals layers, make space space support for green energy. So our uh, next talk is uh, by uh, Dr. Michael uh, Walter from University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Uh, the title of the presentation is Developing Multifunctional High Performance Thiosol uh, Materials for Electronic and Optical Applications. So I invite uh, Dr. Walter uh, to um, share uh, your presentation, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me open this up real fast. Okay, hold on just a second. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna be talking today about developing um, thiazole thiazole materials for various electronic and optical applications. And, um, and I appreciate uh, talking today. I'm from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And so first I just wanna thank very much all these great uh, talented students who work in my research group. And a lot of the slides that I'm showing today, uh, many of these folks were involved in some way or the other uh, in this research. So I do have to and um, give them credit for all the hard work they've been doing the last few years here. Um, so in my lab, we work in the area of molecular electronics research, so organic solar cells, um, electrochromics, and organic light emitting diodes. So new materials for these types of device applications. And specifically, uh, we work with um, new macrocycles for light harvesting photovoltaics, uh, dyes called porphyrins. Uh, we also work with conductive polymer, polymer contacts for silicon structured materials and planar silicon substrates. And uh, recently we've been working quite a bit with um, some compounds called thiazolothiazoles. And you can see the structure right there. Thiazolothiazoles are unique organic molecules. Um, they're two fused thiazole rings back to back. In the center of that molecule, you can see the nitrogens and the sulfur. So the, we have these two fused thiazole rings and they're very fluorescent, they're stable compounds. And in the last uh, four or five years here, we've been um, doing some work using these interesting dyes for a lot of different kinds of applications, sensing, sylvatofluorochromism, and electrochromism. Today, I'm gonna to talk a lot about electrochromism. This, one thing that's really attractive of these materials is their uh, simple synthesis, which is great for our lab. I mean, we, we do some synthesis, but we also do it a lot of device work. So it's really just a single cyclization uh, condensation step. Um, where we take dithioxaminate and, and an aldehyde and heat them together and we form the bicyclic ring system. The yields are pretty good. The compounds precipitate out and they're very fluorescent and fairly stable. So a few years back, we started looking into the area 
of electrochromic materials or materials used in applications like smart glass, uh, where windows can control the amount of light and solar heat gain in a building by tinting using um, an applied bias or electricity. And so you may see this some in, in various applications, you may see this in buildings and cars. And, and the idea is to be able to control the solar heat gain, um, you know, basically to avoid waste energy on heating and cooling buildings, and also increase the comfort for occupants inside the building. So um, in the area of organic materials, there's a lot of inorganic materials that are electrochromic. And for organic materials, there's a lot of conductive polymers that have been looked at. Down at the bottom, you can see some uh, conductive polymer materials. Another really common material is methyl biologin, which is just a really simple, small molecule that upon electrochemical reduction turns a dark blue. So we took this thiazol thiazol system and sort of uh, put the two together and made what many call extended biologin. So it's the thiazol thiazol system with the pyridine rings on the side. So these pyridine rings then uh, can be alkylated. And essentially we get a version of um, methyl biologin. And we found that this, methyl bio, uh, this extended biologin was quite planar. This is the crystal structure of these molecules. Uh, compared to methyl biologin, there's a twist between these two uh, pyridinium rings, whereas this molecule is much more planar. Uh, what was also interesting about these, um, this family of molecules is their high fluorescence. Uh, their quantum yields are very high, above 90%, many of the derivatives. And not only are they very fluorescent, but they're also electrochromic like methyl biologin. So in this picture here, we have two pieces of conductive glass. And in between the conductive glass is, a, is a, a, an organic solvent with electrolyte and some of these TTZ biologins. And it's reversible. We can go from a clear dication TTZ to the dark blue color. It doesn't look too dark there, but it, there's some other pictures you'll see it can be darker. Um, and the electrochemistry is similar to methyl biologin in that there's um, two electrochemical reductions. Now, methyl biologin in um, most solvents, the um, reductions are a little bit further spaced apart, whereas in our system, the reductions are closer together. So you have to do some um, square wave voltometry, which is shown right here, to actually tease out both of those reductions. And I'll just run through this real quick. This is just spectroelectrochemistry. As the absorbance, as you reduce it, uh, a single reduction, you have a strong absorbance at 600. And then that other uh, absorbance near 700 is from the second electrochemical reduction. And that's reversible. So um, we can go from a clear or yellow clear solution to a dark blue, fully reduced form. And of course that also turns off the fluorescence. So it's kind of like a switch. So we first reported this back in 2017. Now, recently what we've been doing is now looking at some different derivatives, some water soluble versions of um, this system, this extended biologin. And Tyler here has been working on um, compounds for this application. And this work actually just came out this summer. And we made some new varieties of these biologins with some pendant groups that allowed for increased solubility, water solubility. And what we found what was kind of unique is that we're seeing um, the electrochemical reductions be spaced a little bit further, which allowed us to actually visually see the purple color, the purple electrochromism, which is the singly reduced form. We couldn't really see that in organic solvents, but we can see that in water. So we made a device um, out of water and we actually decided to go for a hydrogel device. So we have our TTZ derivative, a polyvinyl alcohol and borax to kind of cross-link it. So this is kind of like a slime. Um, your kids at home may make some kind of slime like this. This is just um, PVA and borax. And we use ferrocene as a complementary um, uh, agent to get oxidized while the TTZ gets reduced. And so you can kind of see the, the two color changes. So we go from clear to the purple to the dark blue. That's the fully reduced doubly reduced form. And the ferrocene dimethyl is important to balance the charge on either side of the 
of the um, of the device. So uh, you need two ferrocenes because this can be reduced twice. So you need two ferrocenes. So one to two is good. Um, is what you need in the device to show good cyclability um, and re recover the clear transparent state. And this is just some spectroelectrochemistry of these devices. And the cyclability is good. So the hydrogel is fairly stable. We can go out to at least 250 cycles without losing too much of the reversibility. Also, we can apply the potential and then turn off the voltage and get back um, the dication state, or in this case, it's a tetracation because we actually have these solubilizing pendant groups. And here's just 250 cycles. You can see we can um, do a lot with that. Now, all the derivatives, all the derivatives are not the same. Uh, some of them, and, and I think we, we believe that this mostly had to do with just the solubility of the compounds and sort of how they work with the gel. Um, and so there was some reversibility, but a few of them were, were, did not show the, the um, change in transmittance that we were seeing with some of the other compounds. So there is some you know, more optimization and tuning. We could try other groups here. So there's still work in this area. Uh, what was also very clear is in the hydrogel is that we could turn off the fluorescence. So it's electrofluorochromic. Um, you can see the fluorescence here is uh, eliminated by cycling it through um, doing the, the double reduction um, and uh, so reduce it twice and that forms the blue and that doesn't fluoresce under this illumination. So this is about uh, 390 uh, illumination and you can see the fluorescence gets turned off and we can cycle that back and forth. So this is kind of an interesting application for signs or thin films or um, fluorescent sensors. So there's kind of some interesting applications there for this. Now, this is a dye system. So that thiazole thiazole is a dye, so it is photoactive. And we found that under high illumination, it did start to photochromic. Uh, so it was showing some photochromic properties as well. And we could cycle this off by applying the bias to turn it back to the dication, the, the, the starting material. Um, so that was kind of interesting. So what we found is that we could do a combination of light illumination and electrochromism together and um, actually speed up um, the electrochromism mechanism. Um, and then we could turn off the color by basically just cycling it electrochromically again. So that was kind of a neat extra added bonus to this system. So I'm gonna switch gears here real quick and talk about another um, area that we've been working on, which are, um, so the compounds that I've shown you before are um, symmetric TTCs. These are asymmetric TTCs. And this takes a little bit more careful planning and separation, but the asymmetric TTCs are a push-pull system. You have a push and a pull. And these dyes are really fluorescent. And um, this work was published two years ago. And we're seeing that um, not only are they highly fluorescent, so that the asymmetric, so these are the symmetric ones here and here, but the asymmetric, we um, can get the asymmetric compound by actually mixing two starting aldehyde materials. So you can see statistically we can get these three products. So we have to do some separation chemistry to actually access that middle compound. And we've made a few different versions of this with diphenylamines and dibutylamines and accepting groups like carboxylic acids, aldehydes, and pyridines. And these are also highly planar structures. These are the crystal structures for this um, system. Uh, but what's really cool is we see a very strong sulfatofluorochromism of these materials. Um, as you put them in more polar solvents, the fluorescence shifts further into the red. So in a non-polar solvent like hexanes, we see the typical blue fluorescence that we see for most symmetric thiazole thiazoles. But as it gets more polar, that emission pushes out into the red. So this is exciting because there's a lot of applications for sensors that um, you need dyes that are very sensitive to their environment. And one of these applications is actually a biological sensor. And um, 
you know, I, I don't really work in this area. So we're actually collaborating with somebody from the University of Chicago. And what we've done is take live cells and stain them. And um, the special dye here that Nick here has been working on stains just the outer membrane. And what we can do is look at changes in voltage um, and use this as a voltage sensitive dye. So when you change, when you apply a, a bias across the cell, the fluorescence changes. So um, this is one way to track a lot of different types of cellular activities. And um, you know we're still working in this area, but the dye that we're working on shows good stability. This is on our fluorescence microscope. So we see pretty good fluorescence stability and low, low cytotoxicity. So that's good too. So this is, these are, um, you know, cell studies that we're still kind of working on with uh, Yamuna Krishnan at the University of Chicago. So um, I'm not really sure about my time, but um, I will just get to my conclusion. So, you know, I just wanted to talk a little bit about these thiazol thiazols that, we, that we've been working on, that they're, they're photoactive, they're highly fluorescent. I'm guessing that there's still other applications that we're not thinking about right now, but we've seen that they're also electrochromic and electrofluorochromic, and they show some interesting photochromism that we can couple with the electrochromism. And also we've been making some asymmetric, so asymmetric push-pull molecular probes that are sulfatofluorochromic and they're environmentally sensitive to their the solvent or, uh, or for instance, putting them into a cell membrane. And we're using that right now to look at a possible uh, voltage sensitive dyes for uh, cell membrane. I'd like to thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Dr. Walter um, and um, uh, please uh, feel free um, to reach out uh, to Dr. Uh, Walter by email uh, for asking questions because uh, uh, we have to uh, now uh, move to our uh, next presentation. All right, thank you very uh, much. Thank you. Uh, the next presentation in uh, our session today uh, is uh, nanoscale function uh, in uh, Peru. Hi, this is Jeff Madovetsky from Binghamton University. My research group focuses on the- in Sorry, it's, it started sooner. So our next presentation is nanoscale function in uh, perovskite and organic solar cells by uh, Dr. Jeffrey uh, Matiewicki from uh, Binghamton University. Um, so uh, we will be playing uh, his presentation on uh, his behalf and uh, you will be able to reach out to him for questions after uh, the presentation. play between nanoscale structure and optimal electronic properties and functional materials. In this talk, I'll briefly outline our recent work with using atomic force microscope methods to unravel nanoscale structure function links in organic and perovskite solar cells. Organic and perovskite solar cells are promising for a wide range of applications beyond solar farms because of their potential for low cost processing from solution their mechanical flexibility, lightweight, tunable light absorption, and efficiency under low light. These attributes make organic and perovskite solar cells candidates for indoor light harvesting, disaster response, window integration, and other novel applications. I'll start with charge percolation in organic solar cells. Organic solar cells rely on a nanostructure, so-called bulk heterojunction morphology for efficient charge photogeneration. In the bulk heterojunction, there's an interpenetrating network of electron donating and electron accepting domains, which leads to complex pathways for charge transport. The electrons need to find their way through the electron accepting phase and holes move through the electron donating phase. Since device scale measurements provide little insight into the local electrical properties produced by the nanoscale morphology, We've been developing characterization approaches based on conductive atomic force microscopy to learn about the local electrical properties of photovoltaic materials. 
Conductive AFM involves using a metal-coated AFM probe as a movable nanoscale electrical contact by applying a voltage between the probe and a counter electrode, current can be measured through the intervening material. We've used conductive AFM to map the conductive grain structure in conducting polymer films to measure charge tunneling across molecular monolayers, to measure transistor characteristics in single nanowires, and also to trigger, trigger local reactions to pattern conductive paths in single insulating graphene oxide sheets. For quantitative insight into the local electrical performance of solar cell materials, we've been developing point-by-point -point current voltage mapping. This approach involves bringing a metal-coated probe into contact with a sample using a controlled force, measuring a local current voltage curve, retracting the probe, and then moving to the next sample location. By analyzing thousands of current voltage curves, we can construct nanoscale charge carrier mobility maps. And as I'll show later, local photovoltaic parameters can also be spatially mapped with nanoscale resolution. We've used this PPIV approach to track the dependence of local hole mobility in organic bulk header junctions. As you can see here for a small molecule bulk header junction, the hole mobility and conductive domain size generally increase uh, with the amount of donor component and with the addition of DIO that promotes donor acceptor phase separation. So interestingly, we can see that in small molecule bulk header junctions shown at the top here, whole conductive regions are quite isolated from one another, while in a polymer system shown at the bottom, the whole transport regions are more interconnected. This effect can also be seen in line profiles with the whole mobility decreasing more gradually near whole mobility hotspots in the polymer system. This result suggests that lateral electrical connectivity in the polymer bulk header junction allows for more spatially uniform charge collection, probably resulting from charge transport along the polymer backbone. Further evidence for a role played by lateral charge transport pathways was provided by percolation analysis of the average hole mobility as a function of active layer composition. We fit the data near the percolation threshold, in other words, in the composition range where charge can barely flow, to find the critical exponent that varies with the dimensionality of the system. This analysis shows that the percolation process in bulk header junctions is fundamentally three-dimensional and that lateral and vertical pathways are both essential for charge flow. This is in contrast to the typical case of a single component film. In single component films, we think of charge flow as being uniformly along one direction. However, in bulk header junctions, the acceptor material shown in yellow here acts as an excluded volume for whole transport, leading to roundabout charge transport pathways. So how does this impact our understanding about ways to improve charge collection in organic solar cells? Well, in the single component case, with charge flow in one direction, a common strategy for improving charge transport in organic semiconductors is to align the molecular pi pi stacking direction with the direction of charge flow. As shown in a number of studies, organic transistor performance can be significantly improved when molecules are stacked in an edge-on configuration to promote in-plane charge flow. Similarly, we've seen that when molecules are induced to stack in a face-on orientation, the out-of-plane charge mobility can be increased by an order of magnitude. A similar strategy has been applied to bulk heterojunction solar cells to promote out-of-plane charge transport. And there are examples of increased charge carrier mobilities and power conversion efficiencies. However, the assumption has generally been that more face-on stacking is good and edge-on stacking is detrimental. So in other words, the conventional thinking is that the more you increase the amount of face-on stacking, the more you will uh, improve charge transport efficiency. To test this, we performed a set of experiments with the well-studied P3HT PCBM 
system where we systematically vary the molecular orientation of the polymer donor P3HT based on grazing incidence X-ray diffraction measurements performed at Brookhaven's NSLS2 synchrotron, we determined the proportion of edge-on and face-on populations as the annealing temperature of the bulk heterojunction was varied. As you can see here, as we increased the annealing temperature, the edge-on stacking population increased relative to the face-on population. So at lower temperatures, there's a nearly one-to-one -one ratio of face-on and edge-on populations. And then at higher annealing temperatures, the edge-on population is about 30 times higher than the face-on population. We then used a new conductive atomic force microscope approach to quantify the lateral current spreading during out-of-plane charge transport. I won't have time to describe this method in detail, but you can find further information in the applied physics letters reference shown below. Briefly, it involves depositing an array of micro-patterned electrodes on the active layer, and then comparing the current when the probe is in direct contact with the film, which leads to current spreading, and when the probe is in contact with the microelectrode, which leads to little spreading relative to the microelectrode size. So using this approach to quantify lateral current spreading, we see as expected that when the amount of edge on stacking is increased, lateral current spreading also increases. This is because in-plane pi pi stacking will promote lateral charge flow. Next, we looked at the out-of-plane hole current, which shows a maximum near 195 degrees Celsius. This is interesting because the maximum current is not at the lower annealing temperatures where there's a greater amount of face on stacking. This result shows that having a balance of in-plane and out-of-plane pathways is helpful for efficient charge flow. We also saw that molecular orientation played a stronger role than the degree of crystallinity. Since overall crystallinity increased as the annealing temperature increased, but the whole current actually decreased, didn't increase as expected for a more crystalline sample. We attribute the low currents at high annealing temperatures to the extensive edge on molecular stacking that limited out of plane charge flow. In summary, we see that lateral connectivity plays a key role in bulk header junctions, and there needs to be a balance between vertical and lateral transport pathways for efficient performance. I'll next briefly introduce some of our work on perovskite systems. Using the same point-by-point -point mapping approach outlined earlier, we measured local current voltage characteristics in methyl ammonium lead iodide films under solar simulator light. We were then able to construct maps of the local photocurrent, open circuit voltage, and other photovoltaic parameters. Interestingly, we saw that the open circuit voltage showed an increase at some grain edges. To investigate the cause of the increased open circuit voltage at grain boundaries, we used Kelvin probe force microscopy and second harmonic piezo force microscopy, which both show an elevated response at grain boundaries. The increased surface potential me measured by Kelvin probe is associated with N-type doping, while the second harmonic PFM signal has been connected with cation motion. I'll talk a bit more about the evidence for ionic motion since this measurement approach is rather new. During second harmonic PFM measurements, we applied an AC bias to the probe while the probe is in contact with the sample. We then record the second harmonic oscillation of the probe due to surface displacements of the sample. As illustrated on the bottom left, we propose that when an AC bias is applied, Lattice distortion during methyl ammonium ion migration leads to surface displacements at twice the applied bias frequency. One of the pieces of evidence in support of a cation motion mechanism comes from applying a DC bias in between the PFM measurements. So we can see on the right side, when we apply a positive DC bias to the probe in between PFM measurements, there's a minor effect on the PFM imaging contrast. However, if we apply a negative DC bias to the probe, the positively charged 
uh, mobile cations will be attracted to the sample surface, and that leads to this streaky appearance shown here. Subsequent imaging shows also that there are new protrusions that form at the surface of the sample as a result of this cation accumulation. These signatures of cation motion and nanoscale degradation are only observed under combined stimulation with light and voltage, with the light acting to soften the perovskite lattice and faci facilitate ionic motion. The observed light and voltage-induced cation motion can play an important role in optoelectronic device operation and degradation. In terms of the elevated open circuit voltage at grain boundaries that I showed earlier, we attribute this to two effects. First, the increased surface potential at grain boundaries is associated with N-type doping and local downward band bending. Second, cation accumulation at grain boundaries can deepen local band bending. This band bending can locally attract electrons and repel holes, leading to reduced charge carrier recombination and an increased open circuit voltage at grain boundaries. In summary, we used newly developed conductive probe methods to assess the nanoscale functional properties of emerging photovoltaic materials. We saw that in organic solar cells, charge percolation relies on a balance of in-plane and out-of-plane charge transport channels. Unfortunately, we cannot finish this uh, presentation. A uh, few seconds left um, as we have to move uh, to our uh, next presentation uh, by uh, Dr. Song Ho Yu. Uh, he is not present, uh, so we will be um, uh, broadcasting the video he has sent to us. The title of the presentation is Theoretical Optimization of Bifacial. BIPV module for uh, apartment. Uh, so uh, with that, um, we start the presentation. We start our uh, next presentation for you um, to continue the session. Hello, everybody. Uh, nice to meet you today. It's my great honor to have a presentation in this nice AAA FM UCLA 2021. My name is Sung Ho Yu from Sehan University in Republic of Korea. The research title is Theoretical Optimization of Bipatial BIPV Module for Apartment. The contents is as follows. First, introduction, research methodologies, and third, target apartment description. First, simulation results, and the last, discussions. A large portion of the energy is used for heating and cooling of building approximately from 25% in Korea to 50% in the USA and 40% in Europe. In Korea, already be built as a new zero energy building for example, 2020 public building over 1,000 square meter, and until 2030, all buildings should be built as a new geology building over 500 square meter floor area. In Europe and the USA, already built as 
new zero energy consumption building since the end of 2020. The optimal energy harvesting methodologies, optimal envelope with multifunctional building integrated by patient PV system will be, will be researched, will be simulated in this research. And uh, general energy building as a kind of multifunctional building integrated photovoltaic system will be discussed and will be mathematically analyzed to make an ecological PV envelope system or design criteria close to a zero energy building as a kind of multifunctional building integrated photovoltaic. And most of this research is focused on the ecological use of bipatial PV modules based on the ecological design criteria. This figure shows a special model for building physical information modeling of the solar apartment. This is a this is an overview of a room and a apartment. We can see the in the left side the photovoltaic module as a shape. This is a a hot point in this research. And through this shading PV system, we can reduce the cooling load of the building enormously and a lot through the lot of reflectance of the solar radiation from the ground or from the wall or the, from the surrounding buildings we can get a lot of solar radiation then the photovoltaic module as a shade. They can get a lot of power generation, multi-purpose use. You can say that. As a teaser, the purpose of this research is to classically supply nearly zero energy concepts for a solar apartment. From now on, we can call this type and the NJXA with minimal cost by suggesting the optimal energy harvesting methodologies, multifunctional bipatial by PIPB as a shade, optimal insulation and convergence of radiant cooling system and the PV shade as a type. In the light side, you can see the basic concept of the injexa. Through the optimal harvesting methodologies, you can get a lot of uh, power generation and minimum heat loss. And through the maximum heat gain in winter and maximum elimination in summer. During these processes, we can Consider the regular climate and the architectural culture of a, any region in the world to make a near zero energy apartment for a human comfort and heating and cooling load reduction. And this is methodologies. A high rise apartment is selected as a target building for an evaluation of a DIPP as a shade in this research. Various variables for building integrated PV systems will be simulated to this high rise apartment comparison, many aspects. This is a classical design criteria of DIPB for solar architecture from the effective solar radiance to the environmental fundness the for the sustainability valuation of the building, exactly speaking, the apartment. This evaluation standard criteria or methodology for the solar architecture 
realize in near zero energy building that our research group has developed has become also an official standard of Korean solar energy society. And the Korean Society of Living Environmental System. You can find and the internet homepage here. And the target apartment description. The target apartment is located in the center of this apartment complex in this area. And around this floor, the, the ground, on the, uh, for example, Chinese floor, the unit floor plan of the target apartment, you can see here. This is the living room, room one, room two. In the south side, the BIPB system as a shape will be designed as a shape like this the section of this apartment this is the living room and in the south side the pv module system as a shade is installed like this like this on each floor in summer the solar radiation is shaded by the oval panel, but winter solar radiation goes through to the window, to the room. The target solar apartment evaluation method. We use the simulation tool Soul Cell that we have developed since 2011 to evaluate the solar pattern. The structure of the simulation program, flow chart for PIPB as a shade, we can see here from Soul Cell that as input data. Whether data of a region where the apartment or where the building is located, and PV data, etc. All data for the simulation is input here. And we can calculate, you can calculate solar position, diffuse radiance, shade, view factors, total solar radiance, cell temperature, etc. Then you can get a PV power calculation. Target solar apartment evaluation parameters, possible parameters will be input in this program. This is a modeling for the apartment as a shade. This is a panel on the, on the facade over the window, length, width, the section of the solar radiation modeling, the light one. And this is a photovoltaic module as a shade. And red line here is a is shown the solar radiance, solar ray, all possible solar rays around the building to arrive at the over surface and the under surface of the module, reflected radiance, etc. All things, the real thing. This was considered by the principle of Eve of the Korean traditional house, on the left one here. Very, a lot of merits of the traditional house we can find. All possible parameters of PV module for simulation we can see here from the building latitude, azimuths, longitudes, the System type, unit module dimension, PV area, transmittance, depth, and thermal conductance of PV cell, absorptance, reflectance of PV cell, etc., etc. Other words and reflectance of window ratio, ratio of cell in module, etc. All possible parameters will be simulated. 
and simulation results. For this high rise apartment, you have 28th floor from 10th floor to 9th floor is installed as a shading, shading PV system. And for the shading PV case, and wall attached PV case was calculated, we can compare with each other. And besides this power generation, through, through the shading effects of the PV module, we can conserve a lot of energy from 27.5 to 34 percent maximum. This curve. Unfortunately, we cannot uh, finish um, the video because we have to stick to our timeline and uh, it is now time for our uh, next presentation. Uh, our next uh, presenter, um, uh, I saw in the audience, uh, but I think maybe they uh, moved uh, for a second. But I start announcing uh, the next presentation is on thermodynamic interpretation of the open circuit voltage in energy conversion materials by Dr. Mario Ainox uh, from Department of Physics and Astronomy, um, Bos uh, Boswana International University of Science and Technology uh, from Tel Aviv. Um, so if Mario is not here, we have to uh, make the presentation uh, from the recorded uh, video. So we're going to start that now. Good afternoon, Mike. Ms. Mario Inex. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to present results obtained for the performance analysis of energy conversion materials with focus on the open circuit voltage. In particular, I will introduce a simple state space model description, which enables us to investigate the open circuit voltage in organic solar cell devices by using a thermodynamic approach. Organic solar cells are promoted as next generation commercial solar cells. There are already a few commercial products on the market like the flexible thin panel Helia soil from Helia Tech. The success of those materials depends inherently on strategies to increase the cell efficiency. By material design is one successful strategy to improve photovoltaic energy conversion setups Another is to focus on the device physics by developing approaches that take into account the underlying microscopic principles of the energy conversion. That means structural and energetic system parameters. The discussion of fundamental limits to photovoltaic efficiencies, the enhancement of power conversion efficiencies and efficiency forecasts has been guided to research activities in the field of renewable energy conversion over decades. The key parameter to measure the performance of energy conversion materials is given by the efficiency. In particular, the power conversion efficiency at the maximum power point is defined as the ratio of the power output from the solar cell to the input power from the sun. From the current voltage curve, we can estimate the power output graphically as indicated in that figure. The efficiency is inherently related to further key quantities like the short circuit current, the open circuit voltage, and the flow factor. This relation enables us to understand limiting factors based on underlying models for the energy conversion process. In particular, to use thermodynamic approaches to calculate efficiency limits. First of all, a simple, 
interpretation of a solar energy converter as heat engine operating between sun temperature and ambient temperature will give us the so-called Carnot efficiency as an upper limit. On the other hand, the detailed balance consideration of absorption and the emission of photons based on black body radiation and bad gap energy will give us the well-known shock weiser limit of energy conversion materials. The figure here sh shows the maximum efficiency as function of the band gap. As mentioned at the beginning, I will focus here on organic semiconductor materials. Of particular interest are polymer-based heterojunctions consisting of a plant of electron donor and electron acceptor material. Donor acceptor composites with an interpenetrating structure are seen as so-called champion materials. In these materials, the generation of free charge carriers, which can be harvested at the electrodes, is limited by the complex interplay between charge generation, diffusion, and recombination processes. In bulk heterojunction organic solar cells, the generation of free charge carriers requires that photo induced excitons on the donor material must diffuse and dissociate at the donor acceptor interface before their recombination takes place. This exciton dissociation at the donor acceptor interface starts with the formation of a charged transfer state. This charged transfer state can either recombine known radiatively or undergo charge separation leading to mobile electron and hole carriers. The energy level picture shown here helps to understand the underlying microscopic processes and provides a foundation for modeling the energy conversion process. In that picture, the donor and acceptor molecule are described as a two level system having a homo and a lumo level. The electron transfer at the interface takes place between the LUMO level and the donor at the donor and the LUMO level of the acceptor. Based on the energy level picture, we can develop a minimal state model that includes essential physical features of organic heterojunction solar cell. That model contains electrodes at which charges can be harvested light-induced electron excitation and relaxation between donor energy level, radiationless excitation and recombination, charge transfer at the donor acceptor interface, as well as the possibility of gaminate recombination at that interface. Important parameters are the donor band gap energy, as well as the donor acceptor gap energy. Because organic semiconductors are disordered excitonic materials, charge transport takes place based on an hopping transport mechanism. The figure here shows the four accessible system states reflecting the charge transport in an energy landscape. The system dynamics is modeled by a master equation accounting for the time evolution of population probabilities. The population probabilities fulfilling normalization at all times. In that thoracic approach, the processes underlying the device operations are described as transition between microscopic system states. The transition rates contains physical parameters like temperature or energy levels and are the link to the thermodynamics. Instead of solving the underlying master equation directly, a quite illuminating concept is given by a network representation of the underlying rate process that allows us to decompose the stationary dynamics as cycles. In this framework, a device, as shown in the figure, is described by a graph, representing states and transitions between them. States are the nodes of the graph. The links 
between the nodes represents the transition between states. The transition rates obey the that balance condition. In addition, we can formulate currents, such as the charge transfer current across the donor acceptor interface or the loss current associated with the no radiative recombination at the donor acceptor interface. Under steady state operation, the open circuit voltage is defined as the point in the current voltage diagram at which the current vanishes. Now, our aim is to calculate the open circuit voltage analytically. Instead of solving the zero current condition explicitly, we use a powerful cycle analysis scheme. To explain that method, let us exemplarily consider a simple graph representing an idle photovoltaic cell. The system here is driven away from equilibrium by the processes that are deposited at the red and blue segments. At the red segment, the states S and S plus 1 are ground and excited states of a donor molecule. Transition between them are driven by the sun temperature Ds. At the blue segment, the transitions between 0 and 1 and between 0 and N represents changes in the number of electrons due to its coupling to the left and right electrodes respectively. No equilibrium is imposed by the temperature difference between ambient and sun temperature and by the voltage difference between the electrodes. Now, how much can we learn about bulk heterojunction solar cells from psychoanalysis? To answer that question, we consider three situations. The first situation shows an idle bulk heterojunction solar cell without losses. The fundamental Cycle C1 is a closed path in the state space starting and ending in state zero. For that cycle, we can define the ratio between products of forward and backward rates, which lead to an exponential expression where the exponent defines the so-called cycle affinity. Setting the cycle affinity to zero corresponds to the situation that the steady state current through the system vanishes. That defines a stopping condition, that the driving associated with the voltage and with the temperature difference balance each other. Differently speaking, this condition gives an analytical expression for the open circuit voltage. For the idle case, we find that the open circuit voltage is given by the product between the donor gap energy times the Carnot efficiency minus the exciton binding energy. When looking at the second and third situation, a known radiative loss process is taken into account. In comparison with the idle case, losses are intersecting pathways. Differently speaking, in terms of a cycle analysis in the state space, intersecting pathways corresponds to carrier recombination and energy conversion materials. Repeating the analysis for situation one and setting the cycle affinity zero finally results in an analytical expression for the open circuit voltage, shown here. A new logarithmic term on the right hand side appears that corresponds to recombination losses in the material. Now, the following question arises. Is it possible to give a simple thermodynamic interpretation of the results for the open circuit voltage obtained from the cycle analysis? To answer the question, let us summarize the following observation. Solar energy converter or thermoelectric energy converters are inherently non-equilibrium systems driven by external forces. However, the open circuit voltage point in the current voltage diagram defines a special point at which the current vanishes and the power output is zero. Consequently, the open circuit voltage should be a special thermodynamic equilibrium point. For simplicity, we consider a simplified model for the photovoltaic cell operation, having radiative pumping, which is represented by the sun temperature and an opposing voltage bias, so that the photo current works against 
this bias. Again, the anarchetics is specified by the divert balance ratio between transition points. Now, the focus is in what follows on the thermodynamic properties of the open circuit configuration at which the current becomes zero. After some algebra, the corresponding population probabilities P0, P1, P2, and P3 for the associate states can be obtained together with an analytical expression for the open circuit voltage, which we have derived previously based on the cycle analysis method. We find that those population probabilities are Gibbs-like distributions, which reveal that the open circuit voltage point is a restricted thermal equilibrium point. ZST is the partition function of the restricted thermal equilibrium point. By setting the external driving forces zero, those probabilities are the ground canonical population probabilities well known from equilibrium statistical mechanics. As we can see, the restricted thermal equilibrium population probability is parameterized by the open circuit voltage, which enters as a new parameter compared to the true thermal equilibrium configuration. Based on this result, it is possible to calculate now thermodynamic properties of the underlying system using traditional methods. For example, we are able to calculate the Gibbs Heffern entropy for both the constraint and the true thermal equilibrium. The figure below shows both the constraint. So, unfortunately, um, the time is up. This presentation is uh, over. Uh, our next presentation uh, is uh, by uh, Didier Pascual from University of uh, Littoral Côte d'Opal, and the title is Intermediate Temperature Solid Oxide Fuel Cells Fabrication on Porous Metallic Supports Impregnation of CGO backbone electrodes for SOFC application. So, unfortunately, uh, I don't see Didier or co-authors Zaya or Sara in the session and we don't have a video of uh, Didier so uh, we will have a 15 minutes uh, break if you have any questions uh, from the previous authors that already uh, presented their work um, you are welcome to ask uh, questions now. You can uh, raise hands so that I can unmute you and you ask your questions. Uh, if not, uh, I will see you in 15 minutes uh, by 5.05. And our next presentation uh, will be by Muhammad Khan uh, at that time. Okay, I don't see uh, any raised hands for questions. So um, we will just uh, come back to the session uh, at 5.05 by our next presentation uh, by Muhammad Khan. Thank you.
Okay, so our uh, next presentation for 5.05 uh, was uh, scheduled uh, uh, titled Poly, Polyness, Polymetallionist Coordination Complexes and Polymers for Optoelectronic OE Applications. The presentation was uh, by uh, Muhammad Khan from Sultan Qabus uh, University. Uh, unfortunately, Muhammad Khan is not uh, in the session and we don't have his uh, video to play for you. Um, so we have to cancel uh, this presentation as well. Mm, next presentation, uh, is scheduled for 5.20 p.m. And uh, the next presentation is by Frank Uwe Renner. Uh, we hope uh, that Frank will be in our, uh, join our session by 5.20 p.m. Um, if not, we have to skip that. Uh, and um, the next presentation uh, will be at 5.35 by Alexander Eisner. Uh, I have Alexander's uh, video, so um, Alexander will not be uh, able um, uh, to present, uh, uh, and I will be playing the video for Alexander. So um, I guess we say goodbye for now until uh, 5.20, and hope that uh, Frank Uber Renner will join us uh, by 5.20 uh, to present uh, his talk. Oh, uh, excuse me, actually, I think we had the video for Muhammad Khan, so maybe we can play the video. Uh, we, we only have the PowerPoint, not the video. Oh, it's a PowerPoint, just let me check. Yeah, if, in, if you have the video on the side. Oh, yes, you are right. It was just only the PowerPoint, so we cannot play that one. Sorry yeah, for that. I thought it may be the video. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have uh, the video. Um, so um, um, we will uh, rejoin uh, at 5.20, and we hope that Frank will be with us. Uh, if not, uh, we will rejoin at 5.35. Uh, we have the uh, three uh, videos of uh, the next three presentations. Uh, uh, so um, all those three uh, will be broadcasted if they cannot join us by their uh, appointment time. Um, sorry um, for uh, not uh, being able to uh, go through next presentation, but wish you a good break, 15 minutes break.
So uh, unfortunately, uh, Frank has not uh, joined us uh, yet, and I don't have uh, his uh, video to play for you. So we have to cancel the next presentation. Uh, the title was Touching the Forming SEI Layer on Lithium Ion Battery Anodes. It was supposed to be delivered by Frank Uwe Renner from Hesselt University, Belgium. Uh, but Frank is uh, not with us, so we cancel this presentation. And our next presentation for 5.35 p.m. Um, I already have the recording, so uh, I will be playing the recording for you uh, at that time. Um, sorry for uh, the break in the schedule, uh, but uh, I hope um, you can use this time um, to get relaxed, maybe take a coffee or something, and then join us back at uh, 5.35 for our next presentation. Thank you.
Okay, so we get ready for our uh, next presentation. Um, the presentation title is Towards Mimicking Light Harvesting Organelle Function with Water Soluble Conjugated Polymers. Uh, the presentation is by Alexander Eisner from University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, Alexander with us uh, was with us earlier, but he had to leave. So um, I will be using uh, the recorded video that he has uh, shared with us uh, with you. Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Eisner. I am uh, at UC Santa Cruz Chemistry Department. And uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me a chance to tell you about, about this work. Uh, what I'll be telling you about today is our work on water soluble conjugated polymers as primary components in a water based light harvesting system. So before I do that, uh, I want to very quickly acknowledge the people that made this work possible. Um, first and foremost is my current PhD student, Anna Johnston, who did uh, the over overwhelming fraction of the work that I'll be talking about today, as well as some past and present students, uh, uh, Will Hollingsworth and uh, Levi Matsushima, and of course the uh, National Science Foundation for giving us the funding to do this work, and uh, the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Light Source for access to the synchrotron facility to do small angle uh, X-ray scattering. So the overarching problem on which we're working uh, is as follows. We'd like to construct a soft, structurally tractable, and panchromatic light harvesting system, and we'd like to do this in water uh, in a modular kind of self-assembly kind of way. And the structural, uh, uh, the, 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 the nature of being structurally tractable is very important. So, you know, to give you an example of what I consider as structurally intractable is uh, just a small part uh, of a natural light harvesting photosynthetic system in a chloroplast, specifically the thylakoid membrane. And even in this very abstract kind of biology based, uh, you know, coarse grained view of what the thylakoid membrane uh, looks like from the perspective of photosynthesis, it already looks structurally intractable. It's just too complex. We don't have the ability to, you know, spatially uh, uh, configure such a system and position these uh, disparate components to execute such a complex uh, conversion of sunlight to, to chemical potential energy, and then eventually to, to the synthesis of new chemical bonds and, and molecules. And so in my group, we work with uh, uh, conjugated polyelectrolytes, which are water soluble ionic conjugated polymers. And we believe that these systems can be the building blocks of a soft aqueous light harvesting system for a number of reasons. First and foremost, conjugated polymers have delocalized pi electrons. And this is desirable for, from the perspective of moving electronic charges and electronic excited states or excitons, I'll refer to them, uh, through space. Uh, over distances that are large compared to the kind of molecular dimensions of a single monomer that makes up the polymer backbone. Uh, furthermore, these delocalized pi electrons are strongly coupled to the ionic degrees of freedom. These ionic side chains that impart the aqueous solubility, but also the, the propensity just to, uh, to self-assemble. And as the ionic degrees of freedom evolve, or as these side chains move, perhaps in response to the ionic atmosphere in which they find themselves, they tug and pull on the delocalized pi electrons. And as the delocalized pi electrons adjust to what the ionic degrees of freedom do, they affect things like the, the, uh, the mobility of charge carriers, the, the uh, transport of electronic excited states, and generally the electronic uh, uh, states of the system. And so this is actually quite desirable and very interesting from a number of uh, points of view. These conjugated polymers, these conjugated polyelectrolytes, or CPEs as we refer to them, have rich many body interactions. And just as, as, uh, as some of, uh, of the interactions that they possess uh, that I list here are water pi interactions or hydrogen bonding between water molecules and these delocalized pi electrons, ion pi interactions like cation pi and uh, uh, anion pi interactions, of course, pi pi interactions, hydrophobic interactions, and so on. And so the totality of these uh, interactions uh, in our opinion, gives them much potential to serve as complex uh, hierarchical assemblies uh, for, for, for the, uh, the, the purpose of converting sunlight to usable energy, like storing chemical potential energy. And so in our previous work, what we've done is we, we, we've looked at uh, pairs of oppositely charged poly, uh, CPEs where one of the CPEs uh, served as an exciton donor, 
And the other CPE served as an excitonic center. And what we showed is that if you put these systems together under the right conditions in water, in dilute solution, they self assemble and they give rise to ultra fast exciton transfer from the donor. In this case, this uh, uh, polyfluorine alphenylene uh, model CPE with cationic side chains. Uh, once it's excited, we've shown in collaboration with the R. Bragg Group at John, Johns Hopkins University that these excited states very rapidly transfer to the exciton acceptor, in this case, a polythiophene based polymer, um, in a time of order of 250 femtoseconds. This kind of energy transfer time scale is commensurate with what you find in natural light harvesting systems, which was quite exciting for us. But what's perhaps most special about these kinds of systems, uh, particularly as compared to charged small molecules, is that the connectivity, the physical connectivity between the monomers that make up the polymer backbone leads to really complex and very exciting, very interesting phase behavior uh, that is at the forefront of research in the non-conjugated polyelectrolyte community. So for example, if one takes two oppositely charged polyelectrolytes, non-conjugated polyelectrolytes, puts them together at ionic charge equivalents, at, at, at ionic stoichiometry, um, and looks at what happens uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the solution as a function of increasing ionic strength in the presence of simple ions, what you find is that these polyelectrolytes stay separate and they form a dilute solution and coexisting with a concentrated solution or what some people refer to as a dense phase. And this nice example from the group of uh, Joe Schlenoff uh, in Florida showed, shows that as you take these two uh, common synthetic polyelectrolytes and you dial in the concentration of potassium bromide, KBR, what you find is that the state separation qualitatively changes from something that one can describe as a precipitate-like solid to ultimately a liquid. And so you get liquid-liquid phase separation. And the amount of these relative phases is tuned by the amount, by the concentration of the small ion, in this case, KBR, eventually at high enough ionic strength, merging into a single fully dissolved solution from what started was a, uh, from what began as a phase separated solution. And if one looks at these solutions under the microscope, what you find if you agitate the full system and to be, uh, you know, to be uh, macroscopically homogeneous, is that there is these, uh, you know, uh, effectively drops of liquid swimming through uh, the, the, the dilute solution, showing you that it's a true liquid-liquid phase separation phenomenon. And this interest in the phase separation of, of, of the liquid-liquid phase separation has gained interest, uh, you know, in communities as diverse as biology, where people believe that uh, charged polypeptides uh, may have perhaps been the precursors, precursors to the first organelles, so-called membraneless organelles the kind of organelle that you find in the middle of the nucleus of the cell, specifically the nucleolus. And uh, gr groups like the Christine Keating group uh, have shown that if you take these polypeptides that are charged, they form these what are called coacervate droplets, so these dense phases that are highly enriched in these polyelectrolytes upon phase separation. And once again, if you fluorescently tag them, you can show that these form these, uh, these liquid drops. So our interest began in, in, you know, in the phase behavior of these systems for these kind of observations, and so we looked at the phase behavior of, of, a, of what has now become a model conjugated polyelectrolyte for us, this polyfluorine uh, uh, alphenylene polymer. We put it together with a, with a common polystyrene sulfonate polymer. And what we found is that at high enough ionic strength, in this example, lithium bromide, they did not form liquids. They formed what, what we have now come to know as a colloidal gel. And in fact, the, the, the picture that we formed was uh, you know, a system, again, coexisting in dilute solution of these polyelectrolytes, but in the colloidal gel, you have these regions that are, you know, strongly aggregated regions of very short fluorescence lifetimes and extended regions with relatively long fluorescence lifetimes. But of course, what we ultimately wanted to get to is a light harvesting complex fluid where both polyelectrolytes had to be conjugated and had to act as an exciton donor acceptor pair. And if we were able to do this, what we would gain is, you know, intrinsic proximity between the donor acceptor pairs in this very dense, highly concentrated but fluid phase uh, where energy transfer ideally would be very efficient, but would also allow for molecular diffusion throughout so you can catalyze perhaps some photochemical processes. And the question is, can small ions stabilize such a fluid state? And so that's what we came, you know, kind of went after. And we hypothesized that compared to something like a, an inorganic simple K plus cation, organic cations would help stabilize such a fully conjugated, very hydrophobic complex morphology in water uh, keeping it fluid and, and would perhaps lead to more efficient exciton transfer. And we, the way we looked at this was to, to look at this PFPI, this, this common polymer that I've shown you already, and coupled it with an exciton acceptor that is 
similar from the perspective of a, a, of a linear charge density. They have very similar charge densities and side chain orientation with respect to the backbone. So the registry between side chains would be relatively similar. And we looked at this, you know, ionic, uh, uh, where the, the small ion molecular series where the ions were of a comparable size, but ranged, you know, different in their geometry and, and, uh, and you know, whether they had conjugation or not. And so that's the system that we looked at. And uh, what we found very quickly by looking at the fluorescence microscope images is that the organic ions stood apart. And so what I'm showing you here is the results for this uh, EMIB ion shown over here, but all the results for organic ions were qualitatively similar and also quant qualitatively different from KBR. What I'm showing you here is that the system starts off as a colloidal gel. And as you increase the concentration of the organic ion, ultimately what you find is that the solution uh, starts to merge into a single uh, dissolved state, like what, what uh, Joe Schlenoff had shown and other people, non-conjugated polyoctrolytes. This does not happen with KBR. And in fact, you can see this from the turbidity plot, where we plot the percent transmittance as a function of uh, salt concentration. You can see that for all the organic ions, or everybody not KBR, the turbidity go, uh, goes down or the percent transmittance goes up at the high salt concentration, but not the case for the KBR. So these organic ions really truly stand apart as far as the, the phase behavior is concerned. What we also found is that if you look at this fully dissolved state and you do small molecular scattering on it, you see these kind of, you know, kind of two Gunier like plateaus in the Sachs curve showing you that there's, you know, strong evidence for hierarchical structure of, of roughly on the 10 nanometer and the one nanometer length scale, which is quite interesting. They did not dissolve as isolated chains, they seem to dissolve as complexes at high salt. So, what about the concentrated phase? You can centrifuge the solution, isolate the concentrated phase. And what I want to show you here is that the concentrated phase is truly a complex fluid. It has this you know, kind of a toothpaste-like appearance. You can see this cute little shark fin of a phase that we isolated, uh, you know, that is highly viscous, more viscous uh, than the half-conjugated case that I briefly showed you earlier, which is quite interesting. What about the optical properties? First and foremost, we find that uh, by looking at the fluorescent spectrum of, of the concentrated phase, you can see that, that there is a region that corresponds to donor fluorescence. There is a region that corresponds to acceptor fluorescence. And compared to the control hydrogel sample of the donor only, the fluorescence of the donor is completely quenched in the, in the concentrated phase. Um, this tells us that exciton transfer is effectively 100% efficient. Uh, all the excitons generated on the donor within their excited cytosate lifetime transfer to the exciton acceptor, this, uh, the, the, the one I showed previously. What we also find is that there's some interesting, relatively subtle changes in the vibrotic ratio of the fluorescent spectrum of the, of the exciton acceptor, showing that there are some non-trivial changes that go on with the, with the backbone of the acceptor polymer, uh, uh, um, you know, even when one looks beyond the, the, the exciton transfer that I just described. And this vibrotic ratio does depend on the ion that you look at, particularly once again, you know, making, making KBR stand apart from this EMIB. You can see how this vibronic ratio is quite different from that of uh, that of KBR. Now, one can go one step further and, and interrogate the exciton acceptor itself, um, you know, kind of following exciton transfer and summarizing lots of work in this one figure. We were able to extract the average fluorescence lifetime of the acceptor polymer in this concentrated complex fluid state. And what you find is that the fluorescence lifetime doesn't really change much over a significant concentration range of the ions, but at once you cross the kind of 1.5 molar threshold, uh, for KBR, it changes very little. Uh, for EPB, this pyrrol pyr pyrrolidinium ion, it actually goes down for reasons that I don't, I don't have time to get into. But for the other organic ions, it goes up. And particularly for this T, for this uh, tetraethyl ammonium ion, you know, it goes up by 100% roughly. It goes up by almost a factor of two. So it's a significant change telling us that the fluorescence lifetime or the, 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 the microstructure of the uh, acceptor chain at high ionic strength is actually quite different. And uh, sweeping a lot of details under the rug, it tells us that the exciton is actually quite delocalized over the, ex over the acceptor chain in the high ionic strength limit. This is interesting and important from the perspective of once you do the initial exciton transfer from the donor to the acceptor, that exciton and the acceptor then has to diffuse along that polymer network and eventually ultimately find a hetero interface where the exciton will become electron hole pairs, which is the precursor for any kind of interesting photochemistry that the, such a system might do. And so to summarize what we found, uh, we've shown that it associated phase separation of these CPEs leads to liquid-like properties, but not a coacervate. 
uh, like what's found in, in non-conjugated systems, uh, at least with these chemical structures, and we'll have a lot more to say about this with some new conjugated polymers that we recently synthesized, uh, these concentrated fluids with very efficient exciton transfer, uh, again, all water-based, that these organic ions can stabilize the fully dissolved state ionic strength, but they do not seem to hold any advantage as far as exciton transfer is concerned. And regardless of what ion you use, exciton transfer is highly efficient. And so all of these kind of findings uh, uh, make us really excited about the future of these kinds of systems, whether as, you know, as, as standalone uh, systems uh, that with, with modularity or also as parts of a more complex overarching system that perhaps has a membrane shell that encloses it, uh, you know, akin to the what one sees in, uh, in natural photosynthetic systems. And with that, I'd like to thank the organizers again, and thank you very much for, uh, for your attention. So I also like uh, to thank you, Alexander, uh, although he is not with us, um, but um, uh, you can ask questions from him by sending him email. All the uh, presenters' emails are uh, on the website of the conference, so you can uh, reach them to ask your questions. Now, our next presentation is Design of Materials for Advanced Energy Storage by Cengiz Sinan Oskan. Uh, and uh, Cengiz uh, is not available uh, to present in person, but I have his video, so I will be playing his video for you, and you will have a chance to ask him questions by email. Thank you for uh, being with us, and uh, let's uh, start the next presentation uh, by Chinese. Good morning. My name is James Oscar. I'm with the University of California, Riverside. Today, I'll talk about materials design for energy storage. This is one of my labs on campus, and we are uh, well equipped with clarification and characterization facilities. We have so far 28 patents uh, but granted on energy storage, and we have 50 more applications uh, under their consideration. We have a number of different formats for energy storage the devices. The first one is the surgical cell. This is the famous Panasonic 18 series. Uh, 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 18650. And here, I'm inside, we have the one layers of a separator, anode, and cathode, and in uh, multi layers. And uh, so this uh, cylindrical enclosure uh, is very protected to uh, keep the battery intact. The next uh, problem is the pulp cell. Here, the uh, separator. The anode and, and the cathode are sectioned I mean, into well defined uh, dimensions, and they are I mean, closed and sealed in this uh, uh, soft shell uh, uh, format. Here, uh, I mean, the operator is the, the prismatic cell. So, this is a, a hard shell case, and the, one, the layers are actually uh, are, are flattened and stored in the form. So, uh, both the a cylindrical cell and the, the prismatic cell uh, uh, provide uh, naturally the cheaper solutions for battery fabrication. Um, the, the one on the bottom right here um, is the coin cell, and this is uh, actually very standard in academia because it uses very small amounts of active material. Okay, so one can actually uh, classify uh, the, 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 depending on when you plot the specific power versus specific energy. Uh, so, so roughly, uh, you know, so where the, the supercapacitors, the batteries, the, the fuel cells fit. So uh, the supercapacitors are characteristic with um, high specific power and batteries are characteristic with uh, high specific energy. So perhaps for an automotive application, those two uh, that, that can be combined. Okay. Um, uh, so Maxwell is one a company uh, uh, actually providing solutions to supplement uh, 
energy storage systems. CapEx, obviously a company that provides solutions for very specific applications. And so what we show here, for example, in this case is a vibration energy harvesting module uh, as a remote to a network sensor node. So, so let's take a look at uh, what a supercapacitor is. So they actually possess uh, the capacitors values much higher compared to the uh, standard capacitors. And they can store 10 to 100 times more charge per unit volume. Uh, I mean, the EDLC or a double layer. They can accept and deliver charges much faster than batteries, and they can tolerate more charge and discharge the cycles. And this is given by the very large or enormous gas surface area. Um, supercapacitors can, they can be symmetric or asymmetric, so depending on what you use, the mass electrodes. And the, and the asymmetric supercapacitor actually uh, is similar to a battery. So supercapacitors, or from this point, I'll call them as the supercaps. It can be classified into the double layer and, and also pseudo the type capacitors. So for double layer capacitors, the mechanism is design absorption, again, disruption. And for, and for pseudo capacitors, the, the mechanism is uh, by charge the transfer between electrode and electrolyte. So for example, the redox reactions and intercalation. I mean, the case of EDLCs, we, uh, so uh, I, uh, the, the various forms of carbon are very popular. So, for example, activated carbons and, and iron gels, etc. And for pseudo caps, for example, metal oxides or, or hydroxides, such, such as manganese oxide, the rutanium oxide are used. Okay. So, now I would like to uh, mention about this. A novel material system called the PGM or the graphene nanostructure. So, which is the, the composed of a graphene uh, floor with uh, carbon nanotube pillars. So, this idea was originally uh, so, uh, conceptualized in, in, in 2008. And here, um, at the time, uh, this imagination of the multi layers associated uh, with the pillars in between. Of course, this is very hard to make. And then, in, I mean, the practical sense, you have a single floor and then a forest of tubes on top. So we, so we first synthesized this back in 2009 and, and, and published a number of articles on this a number of times. And we have also a number of patents that are granted on these um, as well. So this the structure can possess very high the surface area. Uh, depending on, uh, so for example, if there is activation further down to, uh, I, I should be able to uh, use all the pores. And after about 3,000 meters square per gram, the, the surface area is possible. So the PGN it can be fabricated on, for example, commercial road roll metros, including the nickel fall. And, and the form architecture is shown over here. So these are rather micro to macro scale pores. And one can uh, deposit, uh, for example, iron particles, there's a catalyst seed there to grow carbon nanotubes. And that can be done, for example, using a ferrocene a solution. And then, for example, one can use uh, bacetylene uh, and, and uh, for example, a temperature between 750 C to about 1000 degrees, depending on the uh, furnish recipe. And then, so one can grow different forms of nanocarbons on top of the fall. And uh, this architecture it can be further complemented using, for example, a manganese oxide of nano ribbons or nano wires to add, add further the uh, specific capacitance value. Um, we have also used this uh, architecture to build uh, some of the fastest charging ba batteries on the planet. And, and I'll talk about that as well. And the goal of our work uh, have been uh, widely publicized by many news channels. So first of all, on the PGN and magnesium oxide uh, hybrid supercapacitor. So, uh, so, uh, so in this case, we fabricated the symmetric supercapacitors and used, for example, lithium sulfate uh, uh, aqueous electrolyte. And so, so one can do 
the number of different measurements on this, for example, this shows the cycling voltammetry measurements here. So this voltage window is very important. So we can uh, we can take a look at the uh, extent to which this window uh, uh, can, can be enlarged into. In this case, uh, well, you, you can really go uh, way too much beyond 1.5 or about or 1.6 volts in this case, because then it gets into the region with irreversible chemical reactions. But, but of course, uh, so there's a limitation with this accuracy lecture right here. And with organic vector we have demonstrated this voltage window going up to about uh, 2.8 to uh, 3.2 volts. Um, we have demonstrated uh, yeah, specific capacities in excess of uh, 100 farads per gram. And uh, so this also demonstrated very high capacities, the retention, which is indicating very high electrochemical stability. Some of the very interesting observations we have made. So for example, in this case, the pores are fully used for the initial cycles. And which so we have seen an overshoot of the capacitance retention. As far as charge storage mechanisms, we have two. So one mechanism, the, 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 uh, obviously intercalation of metal ions, and uh, in this case, so these are lithium plus ions from the accurate electrolyte. And the second mechanism uh, is the surface disruption of, of, of ions on both the pseudo capacitive and the carbon materials. And again, uh, we have seen this uh, uh, a small enhancement uh, of the, the capacitance, so due to uh, the uh, further pore activation in the first few months cycle. We have developed a number of uh, material systems in the lab, and so this is actually materials by design. So the first on the list, uh, there is the silicon nanofiber, the fabric anode. So this is the derived from the from electro spinning at TOS tetraethyl over silicate, and then doing a carbon coat on, on top uh, after a magnetic turbine reduction to obtain silicon. And so this has indicated a capacity of about 800 milliampere per gram. Next on the list is the, the, the uh, mono dispersed uh, silicon carbon composite spheres. This is actually our, our fraction material, and I'll uh, talk about the out cell that we have fabricated from this. So we have we have obtained uh, uh, about 1,500 to 1,900 milliampere hours per gram uh, after 500 cycles at uh, C over 2 rate. And by the way, uh, so C rate are metric specifies how fast the battery can be charged or discharged. So 1C means you charge your battery in one hour, as an example, with yeah, yeah, one amp current. So, so C over two means you charge your battery in two hours. Two C means you charge your battery in half an hour. And we have uh, demonstrated the use of beat sand to obtain very high quality of silica. We have uh, demonstrated the capacity of over 1,000 uh, um, uh, 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 after 1,000 cycles at a is C over two rate. Um, the PGM architecture was used to the fabricated battery. You know, I'll talk about that uh, shortly with a capacity in excess of 1900 milliampere hours per gram. We have used a number of sustainable uh, sources. So, so this is important to demonstrate uh, basically uh, uh, circular economy, being able to uh, upcycle uh, the waste materials and and also be, being able to mean, minimize the carbon footprint or decarbonization efforts. So for this, so uh, so rather than mining the ore, uh, which is the graphite, and then you would have to purify this using a harsh chemical solution. So one solution is to use the portobello mushrooms, already porous in nature and and they can be polarized uh, under an inert atmosphere. And then, so this has demonstrated an analog capacity of about 400 
uh, in, in excess of 400 million per hour per gram uh, after 1700 cycles. We have demonstrated the use of plastic waste and, and glass waste bottles. So this is very important and aids into the circular economy of everything. So uh, the carbon from the plastic waste has been used successfully for super caps and batteries. And the glass waste has been used to uh, to synthesize high quality nanosilica, with, um, which demonstrated uh, 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 an overall uh, long cycle capacity of in excess of 1400 per hours per gram uh, at a CO2 rate. So to realize the battery from PGN, we have actually uh, done some processing to update the cluster shape. So this enables actually the electrolyte to be able to penetrate um, into the structure. And this very uh, architecture basically is seamlessly the, the connected and, and will enable the fastest electro the transfer rate. So this was uh, subjected to a thin a silicon layer coat. So this pro, so PCVD provides a thin amorphous coat on top, so which which aids in increasing the capacity. Uh, of the electrode. So we have indicated uh, a capacity in excess of 1900 mAh per gram. And we have also demonstrated very high charge of weights, uh, up to about 8 steep, and still maintains a capacity of over the 500 in this case. So this is a material which is important for um, very special applications that needs uh, the charge. The silicon carbon, the, the most spear comes from a flagship material, and um, actually this uh, uh, a carbon core. So unfortunately, we have to uh, stop uh, Ustan's uh, presentation because um, uh, we have next presentation scheduled uh, for uh, 6.05 p.m. Um, the presentation is titled Chemically Bonded 3D Porous Network of Black Phosphorescent Maxines Enables High and Stable capacity energy storage. The presentation is by John Wang uh, from National University of Singapore. Uh, John is not present in our meeting, but I have his uh, video presentation. So I will be playing his video presentation for you. Hello, uh, I'm John Wong. I'm from Singapore. I'm going to give a short talk on chemically bonded 3D porous network of black phosphorus vaccine, which can offer high volume and stable capacitive energy storage. This work has been done mainly. To start with, I would like to mention Energy storage is so important for the electrical transport for electrical vehicles. The electric vehicles are coming in by 2040. All the engine cars will be replaced by electrical vehicle. But if we are going to look at this situation for batteries for energy storage, lithium ion is still the working house. Although the others are coming in very slowly, but it will take time. On the other hand, we still need the, the better, powerful supercapacitors, especially with high volume energy density. Then the question is, how are we going to make them? For, for example, for the supercapacitors with high volume energy density. 
So uh, my talk today uh, is on the high volume performance energy storage devices. Also, uh, in addition to electric vehicles, we also have a various flexible variable devices are coming in. So if you go to the literature, you see lots of beautiful images. Uh, so in, in order to make them working, we really need to have uh, the power source with a high volume metric performance. We only have a small space of volume for them. On the other hand, they must be flexible in order uh, for them to be variable, to be portable. So therefore, the high volume performance and the mechanical flexibilities must be combined together. For supercapacitors of batteries, we want them to store as much energy as possible within a limited space, namely high volume metric capacitance or capacity. So if we look at the traditional regular diagram, so if we compare the measurement by mass and by volume, we can have a very different stories. So therefore, the key factor is in order to have a high volume and density, either for batteries or supercapacitors, we need an electrode material which should be porous and at the same time, they must be dense enough. So this is the basic requirement in order to obtain a high volumetric performance for energy storage devices. I just give you one example here, which was done by Ya Ting uh, in my research group several years ago. What she did was we can make use of the graphene. So you can see the graphene layer here. At the same time, we are going to insert the iron oxide nanoparticles in, into the space between the layer. So therefore, we have the combination of the graphene and the, the oxide here in order to have a better capacitive performance for the supercapacitors because the oxide can offer the pseudo capacitance on top of what it is doing by the graphene layers. So this is a good idea here. But on the other hand, we did have the big challenge how we can insert the particles or clusters in. At the same time, we should control, we have a better package between the layer here. So if you look at it very carefully here, we still have a lot of space between the layer. So this is not good for the volume metric performance, although they do not impact on the mass performance for the energy store. So now I come to uh, our work here. I I'm going to just briefly introduce two pieces of work which we, we have done recently. The first one is the black uh, phosphorus with mixing nanocomposite. Our idea here is we're not going to use the electrostatic process to bond them together, but we are going to bond them together with some stronger chemical bond in order to make the material to have a better performance approaching the commercial level capacitive energy storage. So the flow chart to make the material is rather straightforward. We have a mixing, we do the aging by, uh, uh, by hydrochloric acid. We make the crumbled layer of the mixing. Then we are going to grow the black phosphorus face on the surface of the mixing layer here. So in such a way, we can develop a strong bond between the two different layer structures. 
The bonding between them is the metal oxygen phosphorus here. So therefore, if we are going to control the processing condition properly, we are able to form a chemical bond between the two phases here. We have a K-plus, you know, such nanocomposite with a strong chemical bond. So what you can see, you can see the morphology from uh, the SEM image. You can see the layer structure of the mixing. At the same time, you can also see the other phase here. So we have the combination between the two different 2D materials. One is the carbide, the other one is phosphorus. So we can confirm we have a both of them. More importantly, we can confirm we have the chemical bonding between the two phases here. We have also characterized the structure, also the bonding of the two materials in the nanocomposites by different techniques such as XPS, Xon, also XF here. So again, as I said, we needed to have the both phases. More importantly, we have the two phases which are chemically bound together by the metal oxygen phosphorus bond here. So they can be uh, verified by the various spectromic study here. So if we can control the process, the structure properly, we can get a rather high energy density in terms of the volume performance, in terms of the like any density and the power density, if we are going to apply such a nanocomposite into the supercapacitors. So this is a really very encouraging result. So by controlling the package of the two 2D materials by forming a strong chemical bond, we can improve the volumetric performance for the supercapacitor dramatically. The next work I'm going to mention very quickly is the combination between a 2D material and a 1D material. The idea is we can stitch the 2D materials by the 1D material, such as carbon nanotube, in order to have a stable 2D structure. So if we are going to stitch them together, effectively, we are going to have a 3D structure. So this is our idea. I'm going to show you some of the results very quickly. We make use of the carbon nanotube fibers. We can do the electrochemical activation to change the surface. Then we are going to grow the 2D material, such as the zinc, the natrium oxide, the 2D nanosheet, together with the carbon nanotube here. So effectively, we are going to form a structure in such a way the 1D carbon nanotubes are going to stitch, are going to hold the 2D zinc vitamin oxide together. So the, you, what you can see, you can verify the such a stitched structure here. If we are going to examine them, by SEM or TM. We can also verify the phases of the 2D material and also the 1D material by different techniques. If we are going to do the measurement, the measurement is much performed, is much improved by the combination of the 1D material and the 2D material. So effectively, if we are going to stitch the 2D materials by the 1D material, we can have a more robust, stronger 3D structure in such a way we can improve the performance 
in the any storage. So if we are going to make the material as the fiber shaped, uh, like the zinc ion battery, so what you can see, we can improve the performance dramatically if we are going to measure them by different parameters. So if we are going to examine, you know, such a zinc ion battery uh, from the perspectives of different parameters, all the parameters, they are improved by the combination of the 1D and the 2D material. So if I'm going to give you a summary on the second example uh, by stitching the 2D material with 1D material together, we can improve the performance uh, in the zinc ion battery. So we have uh, the open framework structure from the 2D material. We have enough intercalation spacing by the 2D structure we have a high ionic conductivity. We have a highly stable structure. So at the same time, if we are going to stitch them together, we are going to form a charge conduction highway. We are going to have a direct electric contact with the substrate to enhance the transport process. So therefore, we can enhance the charge conductivity or electronic conductivity. At the same time, we have uh, the better mechanical robustness. So if we are going to make uh, the fiber shaped battery, we have the flexibility from the fiber shape. We have the conductivity collection by the fibers we are going to have a fast electron transport or kinetics. So we also have, we also have the improvement in the hydro velocity of the overall structure by combining the 2D materials and the 1D material together. So I just give you uh, some of the examples on how we can get high volumetric energy storage. Two examples, one is by the supercapacitor, the other one by the battery. We can make use of the typical molecular 2D materials, such as graphene, mixing. We can make them. At the same time, we need to consider how are we going to package them together to form a relatively dense structure. So therefore, we are going to have a high volumetric performance. The same applies the 2D morphological materials. So in order to make them better performing as electrode in supercapacitors, in batteries, we really needed to consider how are we going to package them together, stitch them together in order to get a high volume performance by the material in the devices. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, staying with us um, until uh, end of this presentation. Uh, unfortunately, our next presenter, uh, Zingli Zhu, uh, has not joined the, the session and I don't have his uh, video. Um, the title of his presentation was uh, Electrochemical Production of High Purity Silicon in Molten Salts Towards Energy Related Applications. Uh, so we have to uh, skip this uh, presentation. Uh, we have a last presentation scheduled for uh, 6.35 um, by uh, Frank Abdi. Um, unfortunately, I don't see uh, Frank either in the meeting. Um, so um, 
uh, that presentation. Also, we have to cancel that, and I don't have the video from Frank to play. Uh, Frank's uh, title was Modeling Damage in Grain Engineered Voids. Uh, precipitate and microstructural uh, distortions during 3D printing process. So um, considering uh, the, that we are missing uh, our last uh, two presenters uh, for this evening, uh, I have to uh, thank you all uh, for being uh, with us until this moment. We have to end uh, the uh, session and uh, please feel free to reach out uh, to any of our uh, presenters uh, to ask your questions. All the emails are included uh, in the program um, and you have, uh, you can reach out uh, to anyone. Um, so uh, if there is any questions, um, we can discuss or we can uh, say goodbye uh, for end of uh, this meeting.